employees are quote unquote trained to come back to the manager and ask for direction. Managers are trained to give an answer. Why? Because that shows that you, manager, are knowledgeable. Secondly, it shows that you're in control. The employee, if you comply with what a manager requests, you're actually doing a good job. And if I, as an employee, fail an output but followed your direction, it ain't my problem. So we have to break that natural wiring to get question, give answer. Instead, empower people. What this will avail you is the freedom to do the work you need to do. Welcome to the Simple Brand Podcast, the show dedicated to helping you create simple experiences for your customers and for your team members. Each week, we're bringing you amazing interviews with business leaders and authors who will teach you how to differentiate your business with the one thing your customers need the most, simplicity. Your customers live in a complex world. Let's make it simple. Now here's your host, Matt Lyles. Helping you create loyal customers and loyal employees all through the power of simplicity. This is the Simple Brand Podcast, now heard around the world, including Cutoff, Louisiana. I'm your host, Matt Lyles, and today I'm excited to bring back a previous guest, Mike McCallowitz. Mike was on the show back in episode 45, where we discussed how to differentiate your brand so you can grab and keep your customers' attention. But in this episode, we're talking about lessons to help you simplify your business in a way that can make the most impact. If you don't know Mike, he's a top keynote speaker, best-selling author, former Wall Street Journal columnist, and a business makeover specialist for MSNBC. And Simon Sinek calls him the top contender for the patron saint of entrepreneurs. And this week, Mike is releasing the newly revised and expanded edition of his best-selling book, Clockwork, design your business to run itself. Now, a lot of times when an author releases an updated version of their book, they usually make a few changes and just polish it up a bit here and there, maybe making about 5% of actual changes, but not Mike. Oh no, Mike spent an entire year creating 60% new content and then restructuring the rest to make it even more clear today. And Mike and I discuss his simple but counterintuitive approach to creating efficiency that frees you up to pay attention to the things that matter in life and in your work. So regardless if you're leading a team of one, a team of a thousand, or somewhere in between, you need to have an organization that gets things done while you do what only you should do. The strategic, needle-moving, drive-the-business-forward type of work. And that's just what you'll learn from Mike's lessons from Clockwork. So here it is. Here's my interview with Mike McCallowitz. Hey, Mike. Good to see you. Welcome back. It's a pleasure to be with you again. Thanks for having me. Yeah, well, I'm excited about this. Congratulations on re-releasing and expanding Clockwork. Thank you. Yeah, it's exciting. It's been a project I've been anticipating for quite a while. After I wrote the book, I started getting feedback right away on stuff that was working, but more importantly, stuff that was confusing. And I was like, oh, this is like the essence of the book. I reached out to my editor at a certain point and said, listen, we got to do this again. And and the book volume of sales was there to justify doing a revised and expanded edition. So they said, okay, let's do it. Yeah, isn't that the cool thing about a book is that you can always go back and and rewrite it, re-edit it, you know, based on the feedback you're getting. Yeah, you, but yes, and it kind of reminds me of some music. Like some bands will re-release a tune, um, but uh, that tune already better have been a hit. So you, you, like, I never heard someone release a, a song that no one would cared about. They, they remaster and redo a song, maybe they add some tweaks to it. Um, especially nowadays, they'll they'll have like another musician come in and they'll they'll add some other kind of thematic components to it. What was interesting with my books, there's other ones I want to redo, like Surge, I want to redo, not of sales. And my publisher's like, no, we, we've no, it didn't sell up to this point. Why would we redo something that isn't already attractive? So that's the nice thing about books. Yeah, you can redo them, but at least in the traditional publishing market, you have to have proof that this book with a re-released edition will continue or ideally grow the momentum. Gotcha. Yeah, no, that that makes sense. Yeah. Is it already successful? Will it make sense to redo it again? Yeah. 
Well, and so it was originally released, what, four years ago? That's right. I think, yeah, yeah, 2018. Yeah, so it's 2022. Yeah. So what brought you to re-release it now, 2022? So right when I released the book, I started getting feedback from readers. And I think the most critical and most critically important feedback was there's certain fundamental functions. One was called the QBR, the Queen Bee Roll. Yeah. And in essence, what it is, is it is the most singular, most important activity in a business that supports the reputation of the business. And if you don't do it right, you're compromising your business. Many business owners don't put much thought into it. They're like, you know, everything's important. Well, the definition of one thing being the most important is one, the most. And so how do we find it? Well, I, I use deductive logic, a technique where you just use sticky notes and you keep on deleting out until you have one last one. And it was confusing people. I remember the QBR is the most important activity that supports the reputation of the business. I people come back to me and say, oh, the most important activity is invoicing. If I don't invoice, I'm not gonna make money. I'm like, does, okay, but does that support the reputation of your business? Real simple, call your customers and say, we think the most important thing we do for you is invoice you. What do you think? And it became abhorrently clear. No, it's not invoicing. It's your response time or it's your technical skills or, or whatever. So what I did in the new book was really start off with the customer's definition of your commitment to them, what they see as your differentiator, your big promise to them. Yeah. Once you know what that is, and listen, if you choose, you can self-define it. You could say customers like us for our technical competency, but we want to be known for our quick response time. Fine. You can pick that. Easier ways to ask customers. And then once you know what you're known for, your quick response time or want to be known for, then we ask them all the activities we do, which one most drives that, that awareness around quick response time? What do we stake our reputation in, our activity? It's, it's one step to, to do the next as opposed to many kind of considerations trying to refine it down. But I think in the book, I explain it much more succinctly and in our test users, people are finding their QBR, for example, much faster now. Yeah, that helps to be able to kind of clarify that lesson to help the business owner understand, oh, okay, this is what it means. Like, this is that, I think back to, what is it, City Slickers and mm -hmm. uh, Jack mm -hmm. Pounce. What's the one thing? Yeah, he had this like, hook in his finger, right? He's like, well, that's the one thing. He's got a crusty old finger. Yeah. That's it. That's it. There can only be one one. Yeah. And, you know, I forget his name now, but it's called The One Thing by Gary... Uh, Gary Keller. Keller. Gary Keller. Yeah. 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 And... The definition of most or one is a singular thing. And I think particularly most small business owners, we say that all of our clients are critically important. Every activity we do is critically important. What happens is we form this dilution. We do everything marginally. Ironically, in one example I use in the book of many, but one example of a large corporate name is FedEx. And FedEx is them. known <laughs> for delivering packages on time, right? So yeah, I think the commercial was if it absolutely positively needs to be delivered overnight. Well, FedEx has thousands of different things going on, including logistical management. They have customer service department. They have a print shop, for God's sake. If FedEx said, you know what, screw our logistics, which I'd argue is the most important activity to move packages is logistics. If FedEx said, you know what, we're going to double down on customer service. We want to be so much more in front of our customers, but we're going to cancel logistics or dilute at least and focus more there. I think the headlines a few weeks from now are FedEx losing packages, but they're super friendly about it. Like they will go out of bit. A multi-billion dollar corporation is on the jeopardy, on the verge of going out of business because their core competency has been ne neglected. Now reverse that, they can say, you know what? Screw customer service. Let's double down on our logistics. Now the headline is, you know, FedEx not answering phones, but every package delivered on time. It's, it's a hurt, but it won't put you out of business. And so the context here is for our company is there's something that we're doing that is delivering that reputation. And if we don't know what it is, it means we're only hitting on it partially. And that's why most businesses have a reputation for being, meh, you know, a few clients love us, but why isn't every single client raving about us? Because we're not nailing that one thing. Yeah, that's it. And thing with the FedEx example, if you double down on logistics and you say, a hundred percent of packages will be delivered on time. Yeah. There's much less need for customer service because correct. you won't be having those calls coming in. That's correct. Right. You still need to be in the ballpark. It's yeah. illogical to say, well, I'm going to ditch customer service and we'll never answer the phone. But to your point, it, it addresses a lot of these sub issues. So the rule of thumb is you have to be competitive enough. But on a singular thing, we need to excel to such an extraordinary level that no one can touch us. 
And if we do that, that becomes the bearing point for all of our growth. But most businesses try to be exceptional at everything, which means you're exceptional at nothing, and then we're watered down. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. And that's where you get people looking at your business as, you know, like, do you hate it? Do you love it? Are you satisfied? Most of them are like, I'm satisfied. Man. Yeah, right, right. If something better comes along, I'll probably take that. Yeah. And, you know, as a micro business, if you're a business of one or a, a couple of people, we can provide a high level of service and experience for a wide breadth of things because we're working with such a small subset of clients yeah. and we can cater to things and we can be hyper responsive. So we, we deliver service, we mess it up. I can work through the night and fix this. So the experience for this small set of customers is like, oh, this they're pretty good. They'll do they'll go the extra mile. But the thing is that that's not scalable. Right. Imagine you have for 100 or 500 or 5,000 customers. At a certain point, that hyper responsiveness becomes impossible. And you can't hire a way out of it. You can't hire people to work around the clock 24 hours to put out fires. It, it, there's not going to be a, a profit center there. So it, it, scalability is associated with absolute efficiency at an extremely high level or usually a low amount of variability, very few things that you do very, very well. And uh, that's what Clockwork does. It moves these businesses from the, the one person putting out fires or the small business putting out fires to a competency that we can have a consistent output at a very high level. That's it. And then, you know, with Clockwork, talk about being able to have a business that runs itself on its own. But... Does that mean like you as the leader, you as the owner being able to just simply ignore the business, uh, not have to focus it, just completely removing ourselves from the business? No, and, and, and a little bit of a yes. So no, we're not going to ignore the business or disregard the business. We're actually going to move to what I believe is the hardest work and therefore the one we avoid most, which is thoughtfulness about the business. It consumes a lot of energy being strategic, really thinking. I'm not saying, oh, we should make a million dollars more this next year. That, that's not strategic. Yeah. How are we going to do that? Why is that the number? What are the elements that need to come into alignment? There's a lot of planning. It's Moving a chess piece is very simple. You pick it up, you put it down. Thinking about what chess piece to move is going to give you the advantage, that's the hard part. And so what most business owners do is we're just moving pieces around without the caloric burning effort of, of thoughtfulness. So in clockwork, one of the key lessons is we need to get the business owner out of the way of the business. Business owner is, is not only moving the pieces, they're moving, they are the piece, they're moving themselves around. I call it the superhero syndrome. Yeah. I remember I used to watch uh, Batman like in the late 70s, early 80s, and uh, Bruce Wayne, um, at, which was played by Adam West. Like Batman would be called by the commissioner to come in and save the day again and fight the Joker, or whatever the evil villain was. But what was happening was Batman would fight this evil villain. But he was disarming and disabling the police force from defending themselves. Yeah. And that's what we as business owners do. We swoop in to fix a problem or save a client while causing destruction in our business sometimes, but inevitably disempowering our colleagues from, from carrying the load. That becomes a, a bad situation. The commissioner had to keep on calling Batman every single time, becoming more desperate. Right. So what we need to do, and one of the core lessons here is remove the business owner from the business itself. I call it the fork vacation. And, and if someone listening in right now, if, if this gives you a heart attack, schedule a four week vacation, you know, 12 months, maybe 24 months from now, but within a year or two, you've got to remove yourself from four weeks. And if you're like, I can't do that, that is a immediate indicator that your business has fundamental structural issues. Why I picked four weeks is every business I've studied and I've intimately studied hundreds, if not thousands, I subjectively or objectively know of thousands and th tens of thousands, probably more that I've observed. And the common trend I see is almost every single business is in a monthly cycle. We, we attract clients, we recruit employees, we lose clients, we lose employees, we have administrative functions, we close out at month end. We have all this function that happens every month. Therefore, if the business owner can be extracted for one month from the business, the logical conclusion is if, if the business can continue without them for the month, it can continue without them likely for months or years or into perpetuity. So it's the ultimate acid test. Now, here's the key lesson. It's not about the business owner getting a vacation. It's about the business getting a vacation from the business owner. We do this, we're empowering our team demonstratively. We're saying, listen, I'm going to trust you with the keys to the kingdom. I know you've got this. I will support you in preparation for this. But when I'm gone, 
You've got this. And when I come back, if there's problems, and there will be, those are the things you need to set up to fix so you can leave again. The beautiful part of it, I've been doing this for myself for five years, ever since the launch of the book and a year prior. And we have thousands of companies now that have gone through our program and, and reported back on this. The amazing thing is when you come back and when ultimately the business can run without you, you have the right and ability to reinsert yourself in the business in a joyful way. I, I don't want to not work. I want to sit on the beach and just you know drink Coronas all day long. It sounds good for a week or two, but the rest of my life, no, I, I like work. Yeah. But now I have the freedom to choose the work I do. My own business, I choose to be the spokesperson and the author. I like talking about the ideas and I like researching and, and codifying the ideas. And I think we all have the opportunity, but only when the business isn't dependent on us for its survival. And I like how you talked about when you come back, it's very likely that some problems may have occurred, you know, or like some things yeah. happen where, you know, oh, you know what, we need to be able to fix that. I think that if we don't take that time out, if we don't take that extended four week time out, it's very likely that we wouldn't even recognize or notice those opportunities to fix them because we might see some like little things or like little holes where we as the leader can go in and just plug it up really quickly and it doesn't turn into a problem. That's right. But, but we come back like that's when you notice it. I didn't know I was filling the gap of copywriting for our marketing uh, and engagement work. Like I didn't really realize that. I was just doing it, but it really wasn't my job responsibility, or at least I didn't see it that way. I left for the first four week of vacation. And when I returned, I'm like, how did our marketing go? And they said, oh, we didn't have any, right like, queued up. We didn't know what to do. Oh my gosh. I was a guy who's just kind of naturally doing it and saying, just pointing, go there, do this, and I'll write the copy for that. So then Jenna at our office became our core copywriter. She's better than I am, Matt. She's excellent. So she's become the core copywriter. Something else that's interesting that revealed itself probably our second year after the book was deployed, and we were now the third year into the system, Kelsey, she's our president. She came to me and said, Mike, these four vacations are working phenomenally. The team's empowered. Uh, we feel confident of running the business. We don't feel that we need to call in a superhero. But we do have another problem that's revealed itself. I, as president, have taken on most of your work in, in strategic direction. Jenna, now we're dependent on Jenna to do all the marketing. The stuff has been delegated out, so we don't need you. But we are more dependent on our employees now because we don't have you. Here's what I suggest. Everyone takes a four week vacation. Because what that does is it triggers redundancy. And, and I have a whole section now dedicated to this in the new revised and expanded edition of Clockwork, is that what we found is when Jenna now, she just returned from her four-week vacation. When she leaves, she has to train two other people. We always like to have two backups, two other people to handle the workload she has. And when Jeremy's leaving, who leaves next week, and when Aaron's gone right now, as you experienced, Aaron's out, Amy filled in that spot. So there's this redundancy. I've discovered that it's not a question of when you'll take your four week vacation. It's our question, if you'll take your four week vacation, you will. It's this will be thrust upon you. Will there be illness or will an employee leave? Something's gonna happen. So we wanna force these intentional disruptions into the business. We intentionally want our employees out for a period of time so we know that we have their backup. And then if they ever choose to leave or have to leave, now we have that role covered. By instituting a four week vacation for every employee, and these are paid vacations, not only is this a great, a way to attract new employees. We have people coming in internationally working for us because of the appeal to work here. Oh, but wow. I know. We, we just have someone starting from Italy in a week. We just had a meeting about Emanuela who's joining us. We had another employee from Spain who worked for us for three months uh, as an intern because she wanted to work here. Not only is it a great attractor factor, it is even more importantly, a strengthening mechanism for the business. I feel the company yeah. uh, can survive in absence of people now where before it have really struggled. Yeah. Well, you know, I faced this a lot throughout my career, especially where you had someone that had complete ownership over something and you knew that everything was in their head, but nobody else knew about it. We would talk about the, you know, get hit by a bus syndrome, which yeah. Jenny Blake has now taught me to change that to instead of saying get hit by a bus, what if they were whiffed away to Fiji? <laughs> 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 She's the best. Yeah, she, she is pretty awesome. But yeah. what what that does is that forces you to realize something like like you said something's going to happen to somebody. Somebody could get significantly hurt or somebody may have to take time out, you know, to focus on a family member or or they just may turn in their notice one day and say, "You know what? I'm going I'm going elsewhere." So what do you do to solve for that? Yeah. Or or something even more insidious that happens in many businesses called territorialism. It's where yeah. I have ownership over something and now I'm going to defend it and no one else is going to have access to it. 
Yeah. I reverse golden handcuff the owner. Like you better pay me more because you're dependent upon me. Th there's been studies. I, I have a business. We work with many accountants and bookkeepers. And there's been studies around um, people, not laundering money, but stealing from the, a company, um, misappropriation of funds and so forth, but basically right. theft, where it's often a, an accountant or bookkeeper, someone with access to the finances starts peeling away some money, you know, which is theft. One trend is that person builds this territory around them so that no one else can gain access and rarely take vacation. In fact, one key indicator of a, a, a theft in your business is a, a person not taking any vacation. Um, because they're they're protecting something confidential to themselves. Wow. So one interesting thing is by forcing these vacations, we have to have backups. They have to train people. So it actually brings about this protection to the business too, in that multiple people have knowledge and you don't ever depend on that singular person. Yeah. Did you know that in addition to my podcast and my articles, I speak to audiences all over to help them simplify their customer experience and simplify their employee experience. I've spent the last few years leading a crusade of simplicity across the globe. If you want a winning brand, you have to provide a simple experience to your customers and to your team members. Whether it's a live event or a virtual event, I'd love to partner with you and teach your audience how to do just that. With over a decade in marketing, I know how to hook and captivate an audience. And as a speaker, I know how to connect with the audience. Along with my lessons, I use stories and humor to keep everyone engaged and inspired. Then they leave with the knowledge and next steps to transform their business. As an event planner, you're managing lots of details to give your audience the most memorable event. The last thing you need is a speaker who will make your event memorable for all the wrong reasons. Not only will I leave your audience energized and inspired, I'll make it easy for your team to work with me. Hey, if I've built my brand around simplicity, then you know I'm going to make it simple for you. When you visit mattliles.com slash speaking, you'll find everything you need to know, including details on my topics, promotional materials, and most importantly, a link to connect with my team so we can book your event. So visit mattliles.com slash speaking. I can't wait to help your audience brand out from the crowd. I was talking with somebody recently um, who has a peer, a coworker, like, you know, on his team, they're at the same level. And he was complaining because his coworker was taking a one month sabbatical, which, mm. you know, like it's cool to be able to get to that point and to have leadership that encourages and allows for a sabbatical like that. But what had happened was Everyone on this person's team was having to pick up on all this slack, but they weren't prepared for it. So mm -hmm. it was, you were allowing this employee to take the time off, but didn't make sure that you had all the systems in place for things to work well, for things to work like clockwork while they were gone. <laughs> well, well done. Thanks for plugging me. <laughs> we, uh, we use a technique called capturing, um, which I also specify the process in the book, but basically the old traditional approach is SOPs. SOPs is where yeah. we document out a process. We record it uh, on paper. We have pictures and photographs. And we say, here's the system. Captures, similar idea, different method is everything today is done on computer or verbal command or motion. There, there's no other activity. So if it's on computer, you can use screen capture. If it's verbal or motion, like you're moving boxes or something, you can videotape on the, the phone that's in your pocket. So yeah. the resources to capture it. What you do then is voice over any of those situations saying, hey, I'm moving this box from here to here, and this is why. So you actually do the activity, the productive activity that needs to be done while explaining. Well, that explaining becomes the training. So the next person that now is required to do this process, you give them this training video and say, here's how you move these boxes or enter something in our accounting system. But the key to this trick or this method of captures is once the new person is trained or observed in now doing this process, they too must make a new training video explaining the process from their perspective. Because there's a rule of thumb. The smartest student in the room is always the teacher. If you can teach yeah. it, you, can, you have to master it. So by enforcing them to reteach, now you know they're mastered it. But the bonus part is now you have their knowledge captured. So we have a whole directory structure of perhaps it's hundreds, maybe it's even a thousand videos that have been captured. And if someone leaves, they 
fly off to Fiji, swept away to Fiji, yeah. uh, Jenny Blake, TM. Um, <laughs> what happens in that case now is they may physically leave, but the knowledge, the core knowledge they've had, the stuff they've been training is saved. That's it. Yeah. I had actually heard you talk about not using SOPs. I think even someone may have mentioned like SOPs being a waste of time. And I was like, well, hang on, wait a minute, because you want to capture all of this. And then I heard the explanation and I was thinking, wow, because, okay, for one, you're, you're able to very quickly, very easily show what the process is that day. Because like, as we know, things change all the time. And, and if you have to go in and then like based on however detailed your SOPs are, how much of a hassle is it to have to change all those details based on these changes? Whereas if you're just, you know, doing a quick capture or a recording of it, it's based on what the process is as of that day. But then making the student become the master by having them record it themselves. That's fantastic. I tell folks, I'm like, hey, you want to read an SOP? There's one in your glove box. Go, go to your car. There's a whole SOP <laughs> there, whole system. I said, but when you have a problem with your car or something, do you defer to that? Or do you go on YouTube and say, uh, the, you know, the light is lighting up? Most people are going to YouTube because if those videos, ironically, aren't even short enough. People ramble on, but it's far more efficient and effective to learn that way uh, and to get right to the heart of the matter. So if you're not reading through your auto manual, I think that you're you're indicating that own behavior that SOPs are not necessarily the most effective way. They're, they're, they, they can work, but video seems to be far superior. Yeah, that's it. Now, you know, depending on uh, your industry or if you have to be ISO compliant, maybe you'll have your SOPs in a drawer sure. somewhere, but still do the capture method. Yeah, probably, probably. I mean, <laughs> there is some value to SOPs uh, and I don't want to belabor too much, but yeah. documenting a process also forces you to think through a process and perhaps improve the process. But in the transfer of knowledge, there's definitely more efficient ways. Yeah, I love that method. Let's talk about some of the strategies and methods from Clockwork. One of the ones is your four Ds which in the first edition, it was four Ds, but now you've added a fifth D to it, right? Yeah. Can we, can we walk through those? Yeah, absolutely. So the, the four Ds, and now I'll introduce the fifth, are the different elements a business must be addressing, but it's also something that the entrepreneur that choose to be the leader of the organization needs to grow through. So the most foundational D is doing. A, every business must be doing activities that generate revenue, service clients, or are the infrastructural support for those activities. Invoicing, as we talked about before, those are all doing activities. And in an optimized business, I find that 80% of the resources they have, the time and effort is spent on doing, catering for customers and ensuring the infrastructure is there. The next level is deciding. Deciding is a managerial necessity, but it's something that we want to use very selectively. Deciding is where we assign a task responsibility to someone else, and then when we have questions about it, we answer for them, here's what you do. Problem is, this is a form of task rabbiting. Right. Go do this, and problems come back to me. Uh, I call it the Kali syndrome. So Kali was a, or is a Hindu goddess, oh. one female figurehead with eight arms. That's right. Yeah, that's what our, yeah, and that's what we become as a business owner. We become the one brain making all these decisions. It inherently restricts growth. Significantly. That's why actually most businesses will never grow beyond two, maybe three employees, because the owner is deciding for everybody else. We want maybe maximally 2% of our time spent there uh, in an organization, because sometimes you have to just tell people what to do because we're managing a project that requires certain deadlines or activities that it's best to answer that way. But more often, we want to move to the next D, which is delegating. Delegating is not the assignment of tasks like deciding is, delegating is the assignment of outcomes. And it may sound like a subtle difference, but the, the impact is extraordinarily different. Outcomes where you and I agree to the, the output that, say, I'm the employee, will deliver. So you say, hey, Mike, I need you to do invoicing. And I'm like, okay, Matt, it sounds fine. That's an assignment of a task. But then you say, let's get to the understanding what we need. I want to hear from you, Mike, but what do you think about getting invoices out quickly? I'm like, well, that sounds important. And you say, why? And I'm like, well, it's fair to our clients because they have an accurate depiction of what just happened. It's fair to us because we collect money faster. Great. So the outcome is timely invoicing. That's an outcome. Then my job is to follow the best practice that we captured in the video to get there. But any hiccups we run into, I run into, my job is to navigate that because I know the outcome, what we're trying to achieve. And so if I come back to you and say, hey, Matt, I, I don't know how we should sort these invoices, you would respond as the manager saying, 
hired you for this, that thing on your shoulders, Mike, make yeah. a decision here, lead us to the outcome. And um, that's what delegation is. Employees are quote unquote trained to come back to the manager and ask for direction. Managers are trained to give an answer. Why? Because that shows that you, manager, are knowledgeable. Secondly, it shows that you're in control. The employee, if you comply with what a manager requests, you're actually doing a good job. And if I, as an employee, fail an output but followed your direction, it ain't my problem. So yes. we have to break that natural wiring to get question, give answer. Instead, empower people. What this will avail you is the freedom to do the work you need to do. Then the highest level is designing. Designing is where we're spending time figuring out where is the optimal place to put that chess piece, not moving the chess piece, but thinking about strategically. About 10% of a business's resources should be on the design work. The other 10% in design, uh, delegation and deciding and 80% in doing. The fifth D, uh, which we brought into this book, is downtime. There was a study that came out of Europe that incited this and research with our team, Adrian Dorison leads our service division. We've had about a thousand clients go through this program. We analyze what's going on. Downtime is necessary for people to recover. But they found in Europe, there's a study out of the UK, the average knowledge worker on an eight hour day is productive for 3.2 hours. The average knowledge worker on a five hour day is also productive 3.2 hours and on a four hour day about 3.2 hours. Therefore, it's not the hours worked it's that we have a certain amount of productivity before the batteries drain. Our job as an employer is to allow people to recharge. Now, there's a couple of ways you can do it. One is, and we do this, we hire a lot of part-time employees and say, work four hours a day, recharge on your own, oh, yeah. enjoy, enjoy your off time. And sure enough, our part-time workers produce at a level of full-time workers. Other people, based upon their life's objectives and environments, and when we want them, have to be full-time uh, workers. But then we change up the responsibility. We don't keep them stuck in one area. We say, hey, after this, do that. Um, there is downtime just for socializing and total disconnection. And we we embed that stuff to get that three, hopefully four or five hours of productivity a day out of employee. Downtime is necessary. If you don't afford it, you'll be lucky to get one or two hours out because our brain drains. And then we're starting to make bad chess move pieces because we're constantly focused on that. Right. Yeah. And we're much less productive. We're much less effective. Yeah. Right decision now. fatigue. Uh, so we, we want to avoid that. And downtime is a way to do that. Yeah. And then I think, you know, as a leader, as an owner of the company, I think it's necessary to have significant levels of, of downtime. Yeah. And that downtime could be, you know, part of your business day. In my previous career, I used to do this. Like I had this habit. It was on my calendar every Thursday, Thursday afternoon. I had what I called thinking Thursdays. And you, you, you could walk by my office area and you might see me just sitting there, just kind of just staring, you know? And, yeah. but, but it, but it was me like just taking that downtime to be able to think through things. Highly productive. There is a social consequence because the outsider says, you're just sitting there twiddling your thumbs. No, no, I'm spinning the brain. So I do something similar. I just get to do it outside the office space. I don't want the impression to be Mike's not doing anything. Right. So I do, I do sauna Sundays. Amazing. A sauna uh, at a really high temperature for me triggers such focus. I can't think about anything else. It, it quiets the brain. And I can, I just put a thought out when I get in there and I sit there and just start thinking. I intentionally schedule appointments and stuff that move me out of the office where we get thinking. So in fact, just uh, right before our call here, uh, I sat down for lunch with a colleague and we were just brainstorming ideas, which yeah. is another form of thinking. It's not, it's collective, but I didn't do it here in the office. So so they see just two people yapping away. Uh, I wanted to get out of the office. The other thing too, and, and I'm actually kind of reversing my opinion here now, is it's important for me to educate my employees what productivity is. Productivity is ultimately impact. The impact I'm having on the business and we as individuals are having on the business is most important. It's not the physical motion. I, I think as I'm saying, it's like I had to do a little bit more focus on just educating people on what I see impact being. Are we growing the business through what we're doing, not necessarily through the perceivable effort of motion? Right, right. Yeah, um, and I, 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 I may get this wrong, but like I, I saw a visual not too long ago where it was showing the difference between activity and motion. And activity does not equate to motion. Mm, yeah, no, I agree, right? It's that busy work. Yeah. 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 
Yeah. I mean, listen, you could be a ditch digger, but you're digging the hole in the wrong spot. Like, great. You dug a ditch, but it's totally the wrong spot and it's not where we need it. And it's going to do nothing. That person's busy, uh, but are not driving impact. Yeah. Yeah. That's it. That's it. Well, you know, just talking through all of this, um, especially when we talk about delegating and empowering employees to make these types of decisions, everything we've talked about so far, it sounds like that the clockwork lessons, the clockwork mindset isn't just for the leader. It's for everybody in the team, everybody in the organization. That's been the biggest shift in the book. So we we were talking pre-air, the new version of clockwork is 60% brand new content, new case studies, new strategies, hopefully radically simplified, but as impactful, if not more impactful strategies. And uh, the original 40% still there has been moved around. So it's reorganized. Um, So it's a much more fluid system, in in my opinion. Well, one of the big pieces of feedback I got, Matt, was, this is funny, it was one of the first readers that read said, I love this book, but, and I was like, "Uh oh, I don't want to share with my employees because it's all about me taking a vacation. And I'm like, oh my God, that was, that I missed the mark on that. That's not what I'm trying yeah. to communicate. But I'm empowering employees. I want employees to read the book so that they can step up into who they want to be. So they can empower the company. So the new book, every chapter has a section explicitly and specifically for employees to deploy the strategies. I hope now that someone who leads a company or owns a company will use this book or circulate the book with every colleague they have so everyone can step up. Yeah, employees need to do this. Without employees, and let me give you a little context, only 14% of the world population ever starts or owns a business. Of that 14%, only 20% are sustainably successful after five years. That means 3% of the world population runs good, healthy businesses. 97% of of the population is looking to work for a good, healthy business. Right. Our job as entrepreneurs and leaders is to create jobs, not do the job. And that's what I'm hoping entrepreneurs will go move on to is building a company that can support people who want to do the work within a good company. Hopefully the book will serve both those groups, the, the employees of an organization and the owner of an organization. Well, and we think about where we are today, 2022, we're still dealing with the great resignation. Right. And there are a number of factors that employees say go into their decision to leave one employer and go to another or to be loyal to an employer. And one of those factors is an ownership in the company. It doesn't always have to be like stock ownership, but just an ownership in the company and an ownership in their work. And I think with these lessons here and how you describe the right way to delegate and the right way to empower employees, this is going to give them that feeling of ownership in their work. Oh, well, that, that's kind of you. But yeah, I, I hope I hope that happens. This is a quick aside. I'm working on my next, next book. That's what I'm always doing. And I've been studying this concept of what's called psychological ownership. Yes. And a real quick analogy is no one washes a rented car. When, when we are assigned responsibilities, you know, fill up the gas tank, make sure there's no dents or scratches, return it clean, we will defy where we're not required to comply. But, you know, so we'll seek ways, say, I'll rent that car, I'll take a, a donuts in the parking lot because I wasn't told to do that. Yeah. When we assign our employees responsibilities, we'll comply and seek ways to defy. Interestingly, when we're given ownership, and ownership has uh, control, the ability to personalize uh, intimate knowledge. Like when I own my car, recently I just went for a long drive. I patted the dashboard and said, good girl. I, I can't believe I even said that. Like, good girl. There's a sense of of connectivity. That thing is part of me and I treat it radically different. My car gets washed every Saturday by hand. I buff it myself. We can employ ownership or, or transfer that psychological ownership to our colleagues and the way they'll behave is radically different because now it's part of them as opposed to just task rabbiting people, which actually causes sometimes defiance. Right, right. That's it. Yeah. I'll be excited when when that book comes out because I, I love that concept. All right, Mike, I got uh, one last question for you. If you were to create a five song soundtrack for Clockwork, what songs would you include? Yeah. So I, I've been thinking about this and uh, I got to start off with a little ACDC. Yeah. Um, a couple ones you may not know, but for, I'll start off with one you definitely know. It's called Back in Black. Yeah. Um, because that's what I'm all about. Like so many businesses are in the red. Yeah. Uh, job number one is back in black. This song you may not know is called Fly on the Wall. Um, oh, wow. And yeah, it's kind of a, a B-sider. But what's so good about this song is, to me, 
is it gives you that perspective from the outside. I think we can learn so much when we can see something from the outside and observe how it's going. And that's why I hope my books do is they, they share compelling stories of others where we can kind of insert ourselves in the story, but not live through those pains and struggles and learn from it. Then the next one I would do is a flip of the switch. It's another B-sider. <laughs> nice. Freaking. Yeah. With a flip of the switch. Um, such a good song. But radical improvement in your business is typically one or two moves away. It is a flip of the switch. Yeah. Just do this and the impact is radical. Most people are trying to turn knobs, flip switches, uh, rotate things. We're doing too much. We actually just got to pick the one thing to do. And how you do it, uh, there's a song by Foo Fighters, so now I'm leaving ACDC uh, behind. Foo Fighters, times like these. Yeah. It's really about being in, in the present and valuing what we're going on. If we simply slow down, uh, live in the present in our business, we can flip the right switch. And the last thing I would end it on is uh, probably Rock of Ages by Def Leppard. Huge Def Leppard fan growing up. But that's, a, to me, one of the most celebratory songs from the hair metal days. Yeah, That's what we need to do realize you're one of of very few humans on this planet that's built a business that's building a business you're a great risk taker i believe society should should regale in the fact you've done this i used to say small business uh is the backbone of the economy a very common phrase i totally took the back i actually regret that small business is not the backbone of the economy small business is the economy and as small business goes so does the rest of everything we need and we've always had small business success it comes in different flavors but small businesses become big businesses. Without the small business startups, we'd never have the Googles or the Ubers or whatever it comes about. Small business is the economy. We need their success. And we all need to celebrate that. That's why it's Rock of Ages. Yeah, absolutely. Wow, love that. Very hair metal uh, kind of spin. A little yeah. grunge in the middle there, Foo Fires, but pretty much hair metal. There you go. You, you know, after, we, after this call, I'm going to go rock out. <laughs> there you go. Well, Mike, thank you so much for being here. I've learned a lot, but where can people go to learn more from you? So uh, you can go to MikeMichalowitz.com, but spelling my last name is like murder. So I have a shortcut, Mike Motorbike. It's a nickname I got in grade school. It's the only G-rated nickname, Matt, that I've ever had. Like there's other ones, but they're so yeah. filthy. I can't repeat them, but you can go to MikeMotorbike.com. On there, every book I've written, there's free chapter downloads. You can experience those. I used to write for the Wall Street Journal. I have my own podcast too. You can get all that content for free at mikemotorbike.com. Excellent. All the lessons, all the books, all the things right there. Yeah. Cool. Well, Mike, I am so grateful for your time here. Thank you. Matt, thank you. As always, it's good to see you again. And I just appreciate this. I hope you enjoyed my discussion with Mike McCallowitz. So go and visit him at MikeMotorbike.com. You'll get access to all his resources and his lessons and samples of all his books. And if you want to dig even deeper into the lessons we discussed today, then go and get your copy of the newly expanded and revised Clockwork, Design Your Business to Run Itself. It's out this week. And if you're enjoying the Simple Brand Podcast, go ahead, hit the subscribe button. It's going to make it so much simpler for you to get future episodes like the next one featuring Alex Dimchek. Alex is a former SEC quarterback for the Missouri Tigers, but I don't even hold that against him. He's also a top keynote speaker and a trainer for the John Gordon Companies. And he's the co-author of the best-selling book, The Cell the number one strategy to build trust and create success. Alex and I discuss his lessons on integrity and trust. Not only do we talk about how to build the right habits to instill integrity into your personal brand as a leader, we also discuss how you can help your employees build those habits too. So go ahead and subscribe. You'll automatically get Alex's episode as soon as it's live. Until then, keep it simple. Thanks for joining us for this episode of the Simple Brand Podcast. Want to make your listening experience simple and automatically receive each new episode? Visit our website, simplebrandpodcast.com, where you can subscribe to the show in iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you listen. If you're finding value from the Simple Brand Podcast, leave us a rating or review. That helps us get the show to the ears of the people who need it most. Be sure to catch Matt right here next week. Same Matt time, same Matt channel. Until then, keep it simple.